All right, good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off here. And the session that I have prepared and brought for you today is what I'm calling Zero Trust Threat Modeling. And so in case I haven't met you yet, my name's Chris Romeo. I'm the CEO of DaVici. Uh, I've been in the world of security for like 100 years at this point, so it's been a while, um, actually 26 years. Um, I do a, a number of different podcasts. Uh, Application Security Podcasts is the most popular. That's my co-host, Robert Hurlbut, sitting over here in the front. Um, previously, before DaVici, I was the co-founder at Security Journey, and I spent about 11 years at Cisco, where I rolled out threat modeling to uh, Cisco's engineering communities. So the premise of this talk that I'm going to share with you today is really the fusion of zero trust, which is a, an area that's getting lots of attention, and threat modeling. So I, I came to this as someone that had studied threat modeling extensively, but was relatively new to zero trust. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the learning process that I went through, as well as share with you a new way that I think you can apply threat modeling to zero trust. And so really the question that people are trying to figure out today is, you know, how do we handle the complexity that zero trust brings to us uh, and, and, and in regards to our security and privacy design? And so from an agenda perspective, I'm very quickly going to bring you up to speed on Zero Trust if you haven't spent a lot of time with it and, and really studied it. And then I'm going to do a threat modeling crash course, which is going to be shorter because I'm at an OWASP conference where people are going to have some basic understanding of threat modeling. And then we'll talk about how uh, the impact of Zero Trust on threat modeling, how that with changes with threat modeling in a Zero Trust world. And then I'm going to take you through what I've created as a reference threat model. So I went through and, and looked at the reference architecture and created a reference threat model as a result. So very quickly, I know those words are probably small for those in the back, but um, this, is, this is from NIST SP 800-207, which is NIST's definition of what Zero Trust is supposed to be. And it's important to understand this as AppSec people because you probably haven't really looked at zero trust that closely. And so just very quickly to summarize, from a zero trust perspective, all data sources and computing services are resources. So everything we're going to talk about in a zero trust world is a resource. All communication is secured regardless of network location. So we're going to assume that there's TLS everywhere. Access to individual resources is granted on a per session basis, so we're going to have session management of some form that has to be a part of this. You'll notice there's some patterns in the OWASP world that are, that are popping out that are, that are applicable from a zero trust perspective. We're going to do dynamic policies. We're going to monitor and measure the integrity of all of our assets. We're going to do authentication and authorization on a dynamic basis. And then we're going to collect as much information as possible to help our security posture in the future. So if you were to go read NIST's guide on zero trust, this is a high level summary of what you would find there. But hopefully it brings you up to speed on, on what zero trust is. So very quickly, let's talk about what threat modeling is in a zero trust context. And so I had to go to the definitive source on what threat modeling is, the Threat Modeling Manifesto, which there's a few of the authors uh, of the manifesto sitting up here in the front, and I was lucky enough that they let me tag along as well. Um, but we created a, a definition, and I've modified it just, just slightly to capture zero trust threat modeling. So zero trust threat modeling analyzes zero trust system representations to highlight concerns about security and privacy characteristics. So walk our way backwards into that. What are we looking for? We're looking for security and privacy challenges in the design using a representation. So in this case, we're going to use network architectures that are, that are mapping what's happening in a zero trust world. But there's also lots of different representations you can use. But if you have not looked at the Threat Modeling Manifesto, that is the place to start from a threat modeling perspective. So what are the benefits we get out of, out of applying threat modeling to zero trust? Well, first of all, we're going to build security into everything that we're doing when we build out these zero trust architectures. We're going to find our security and privacy problems earlier in the process, and we're going to simplify what is a very complicated system. Threat modeling is something that can help us to really pinpoint and, and break down complicated things into smaller pieces so that they're easier to analyze, easier to understand. And so that's one of the really big goals there. So when I think about threat modeling, for me, if I simplified it to its most basic form, it's a security feedback loop. And this applies to zero trust as well. We're going to identify a problem, we're going to evaluate what our mitigations are, and then we're going to change our design. And we're going to continue on this loop from the time we have the idea about whatever we're building until we end of life, end of sale, whatever it is, so that it goes away, we decommission, we make it go away. So I'm a relatively simple threat modeling 
approach person, and so I like data flow diagrams, and I like the simplicity of them. And so very quickly, when we think about a data flow diagram, our external entity maps something that's outside of our system that's going to be, going to be uh, facing into or trying to connect or communicate with the things that we're building. And then inside, we have a process which maps our unit of work. And then we have a data store that is a database, a file, something that's storing some of our information. And then the trust boundary wraps around it to help us understand the difference between outside and inside. Now, if you've studied zero trust in any regard, there's a lot of discussion or debate in zero trust as to whether you even have trust boundaries with this, this new style of environment. And I think it depends on how much budget you have to spend on zero trust as to whether you think you have boundaries or not. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Secure by Design is getting a lot of attention these days. And so CISA, they were nice enough to write a definition for Secure by Design. Um, I didn't like their definition all the way, so I made my own definition, but I kept some pieces of what they described here. And so I think it's important in the context of threat modeling to be thinking about Secure by Design going forward. And so for me, Secure by Design is the art and science of prioritizing security and privacy to reasonably protect the stuff you build against security threats and privacy threats. I did borrow the reasonably concept from CISA here in their definition. And like, this is the first time I can remember anybody discussing this idea of reasonable security and applying it to something. And so I think it's, it's, it's interesting that we've highlighted that now. And it's important that we consider this going forward because we've lived in this world where everything's critical. Like most of us grew up in that world. Anybody that's got a little bit of gray hair, we grew up, that grew up in security, we, or doesn't have hair. Um, <laughs> But we grew up, if we grew up in security like that, there was, everything was always critical. Everything was always the top priority, top emergency. This reasonably word kind of helps us to, it unlocks that for us. It gives us the ability to say not everything is critical. So if we look at secure by design and we slightly tweak it to think about how it applies to zero trust. So when we think zero trust, builders and defenders have to share in ensuring security outcomes with the customer. This is, this is CISA's secure by design principle but I adapted it a little bit for zero trust because it's important. This is a shared responsibility. Those that are building zero trust have to take pride in building safe and secure products. That's something I wish we could say about everything that, that is built today. And then you've got to have executive buy-in for anything, including applying secure by design to zero trust. So how about secure by default? Another big uh, part of that CISA document. Turns out many of the things that secure by default prescribe are things that's, that, that Zero Trust already does. So eliminating default passwords, Zero Trust is big on multi-factor, it's big on single sign-on, it's big on secure logging, and you know, reduce hardening guide size. I love this forward-looking security over backwards compatibility. I had to, to think about that quite a bit, but our industry has been so much in the opposite of that in that we've all, we're always like, we have to have backwards compatibility, so we have to keep things insecure. No, no more, let's just draw a line and say we're gonna hopefully throw out all that old stuff, which I know is not, a, it's not real. We have to, <laughs> if everything worked that simply, then we would, security would be easy and everybody would do it. So how about the zero trust maturity model? So this is another document from, uh, from NIST that has some uh, basically descriptions of various levels and things. But for me, unpacking the zero trust maturity model was just, it pinpointed the fact that there's a treasure trove of threats to be found here from the identity to the data that's being stored to the applications that are running. There's just a lot of interesting things that we can unpack there. So let's start to think about what's different with zero trust threat modeling, different from what we would think of as technic technical threat modeling of features or something. So first of all, there's this idea of the death to the trust boundary. I mean, from, from a classic threat modeling perspective, it's always been about the trust boundary for us. There's always been an outside inside, and let's focus on where those things cross over that trust boundary, and let's focus on the assets we're protecting on the inside. But in a zero trust world, we may not have an outside inside anymore. If you look at like Google's Beyond Corp reference way that they uh, run the Google networks now, there is no inside and outside. Everything's using real world IP addresses and whatnot. The other thing, things to think about here when a, for the zero trust threat modeling, well, there's more exposure to your data sources because the data sources are more, more in play here. The data flows are better protected because we've said zero trust is supposed to be encrypted, everything's supposed to be encrypted by default. There's a focus on our authentication and authorization policy engines, infrastructure plays a bigger role, and really the network is the wild, wild west in a, zero a, a true zero trust environment. You cannot trust 
that people are going to do the right thing on the network. So when I think about a threat modeling process very quickly, let's apply this. Um, you'll see I like to break this into five steps. Scope, let's figure out what we're going to model. Let's draw a picture of it because I like data flow diagrams and they're simple and they make sense to me. Let's analyze that thing. Let's mitigate the threats that we've come up with based on our analysis and then go through a retrospective step. So those are the ways that I break down the threat modeling process. So when we think about scoping from a zero trust perspective, we do have to think about sizing, like how are we going to choose the right scope so that we don't try to threat model something that's too big? Because that's one of the biggest challenges that, uh, that, that we have, when, when we, especially when we start threat modeling. We threat model things that are, the scope is too large and we end up with 500 threats and we never get anywhere with it. And everybody says it was, we just created a document that doesn't have a lot of value to it. So it's about scoping down and choosing the right size, considering what the security relevance is of the different choices that we have available. And then I like to think about scoping from an interface as an attack surface analysis. What are the ways that attackers could potentially try to communicate or users are communicating with the thing that we're building? So if we break the pieces of zero trust down into kind of small, medium, large, extra large, you can think about like a single authentication or authorization flow in a zero trust system as being something that would be a small size of scope to try to threat model. And I think that'll take you two to eight hours. And then as you can see, as we get larger there, multiple flows, looking at an entire subsystem or the entire system, and yes, I put infinity next to the amount of time it'll take you to threat model the entire system. Because when you're dealing with something that complicated, you'll never, you can never finish it. It's always a work in progress. And so we want to scope down. We want to we threat model the smallest possible thing. <clears throat> so from the draw perspective, it's important to make this point because in the world of zero trust, there is this idea of a reference architecture. And if you go to Google Images and you type in zero trust architecture, you will literally get 74 pictures from various vendors and they're all the same exact architecture. They have the same components, the same pieces, and then the vendor's little logos and colors on the side. The point is, in the real world, there is no reference architecture. When you're building a real life system, it's not as cut and dry as, well, we have one of these and one of these, and they always connect this way. That's not how, the real, how real world system building works. And so I want to just ensure we make this point here that we have new threats in all shapes and sizes, and this idea of a reference architecture, there is really no reference architecture when you start building something. So let's, let's start with what I have available to work with, because I was trying to, when I went to do that Google search, I was hoping somebody had posted their architecture picture. But unfortunately, people tend to keep their network architectures relatively protected. And so I did have to kind of work a little bit off the reference side. But when we think about zero trust architectures, subjects and objects, subjects are actors that are trying to access or perform actions upon some type of object, we have a policy enforcement point in between them. That's the core of the zero trust architecture. So if we're going to do analysis, <clears throat> one of the first ways that we can think of to do this when we're just getting started is could we apply stride to this zero trust architecture? Stride being spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. This is the base set of threats that I start with when I'm looking at anything because it's the one that I, I feel like I know, I know the best without thinking a lot about it. Let's see what happens when we try to apply Stride to the world of zero trust though. So in this case, we have spoofing and tampering. So modifying the data via tampering while it's in flight or trying to spoof one of the other subjects as an attacker. We talked right off the top about zero trust tenant number two says all communication is secured regardless of no network location. So we're not going to be able to spoof or tamper something that's fully TLS encrypted from end to end. So spoofing and tampering is not going to be, not going to provide us, there's not a lot of threats that we need to mitigate there. So how about repudiation? How about being able to prove that somebody did some, some action they weren't supposed to? Well, in the zero trust maturity model, it describes using a SIM solution to store all your logs and being able to kind of bring those all together in one point. And so given that logging is a core component in the maturity model for zero trust, then it's pretty simple to say, we're not really going to think we're going to struggle with repudiation very much. How about information disclosure? Sure, we could have information disclosure in almost any interface, right? No matter where, no matter, no matter what we've built, this is always something we at least have to ask the question. Is information disclosure something that's possible here? So that, that could be a potential threat. 
Denial of service, a magnified threat gives open to, given the open access profile of zero trust, maybe we can generate a denial of service against a component that's deeper in the architecture than we would be able to if there was a clear delineation of a firewall at the edge that was stopping the traffic from coming through. So given the open approach of uh, zero trust, this could be something that we have to think about, something that, that, that would require some deeper consideration. So elevation of privilege, becoming a, a, a user account or a user with higher privileges as an attacker, that's why zero trust exists, is to prevent that. So elevation of privilege is not something that is going to, not going to be a threat that's going to require a huge amount of mitigation as a result of this. And so if we start to summarize how Stride fits together here, spoofing tampering, we said TLS is everywhere, so it's not really a challenge. We've got logging as a component of the maturity model, so repudiation is covered. We could have to worry about information disclosure maybe a little bit, denial of service, but not really elevation of privilege. So what we've learned here, though, is that Stride is, is not really informing us with a lot of actions to come from looking at zero trust threat modeling. So when we think about Stride, there certainly are CAN mitigations, things like applying multi-factor, adding encryption, doing logging, doing scalability, or implementing a zero trust architecture. But in the case of the Stride threats, it didn't really show us that much. And so from a retrospective perspective, did we do a good enough job? Well, we didn't really have a solid set of threats to consider here, so I don't feel like we did do a good enough job. <clears throat> but let's talk about, I'm going to show you kind of what I think you need to do a good enough job here. That's, that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. But let's talk for a second again about why are we doing zero trust threat modeling. We talked about how not every architecture is, uh, is as infallible as the reference architecture, and not every design is as clean. I know. It's tough to imagine there could be problems in something that we build. People make mistakes when designing things, even security people. Like, oh, we don't believe that, right? We, we, we operate with a, a zero defect approach to the things that we build. No, we build things that are breakable. There's nothing special about us that says we can build something that no one could ever get into. Last thing to remember is anything is possible. Any threat is possible. I have this, I see this play out sometimes when I teach people threat modeling and there'll be, there'll be two people and one person will have an idea and someone else will say, well, that could never happen. And I immediately say, stop. We don't care whether it could happen. We have nation states around the world that are cooking up exploits. If you can think of it, somebody in another nation state could potentially think about it. A cyber criminal somewhere could think about the same challenge that you were able to think about. So we don't have to prove any of these things using exploits. That's the beauty of threat modeling. We think of it. If you can think of it, somebody else on Earth can think about it too. But I really want to, uh, to, to the focus of this is how do, we, how do we make our architecture designs better? And so from this perspective, this is a kind of a little more complicated diagram. Yes, once again, this is built on the reference architecture because no one would send me their network architecture to put up on a slide at OWASP. So there's continuous diagnostics and management. That's, that's important to know. That is a, a set of software tools that are going to inform via agents about the other things that are happening in the architecture. You've got our SIM we talked about. You've got Threat Intel, both of Threat Intel and CDM as an input to the policy engine. You've got data policies that are having an effect. You have user, non-person entity is a computing service or something that can authenticate and be authorized that doesn't have a person driving it. Think some type of code you wrote somewhere or a serverless function. We've got attackers, you've got identity management and PKI. And then in, in Zero Trust, we split the control plane from the data plane. Be, with the data plane being, here's where the traffic moves. The control plane is how we operate the environment, how we administer the environment, so that we are only ever letting users and attackers access the data plane on the bottom and not the things that we use to, to run the Zero Trust system. So, as I said, Stride didn't work when threat modeling zero trust. And so I worked with a partner on creating a methodology. Now, I came up with all the words that go into it, and my partner on this effort came up with the mnemonic for it of capitals. Now, my partner was ChatGPT, I can admit it, <laughs> okay? Because I thought I, I started analyzing all the different documents I had on, on Zero Trust, and I came up with all of these different categories, but then I couldn't find a way to put them into a mnemonic. So there's where AI wins the day in creating a mnemonic for me. 
But look at these categories now. Very, some of them are, are similar to what we see in Stride, but others of them are new categories that are new classes of things we have to consider when we think about zero trust. So it starts with C for compromise and exploit. So getting unauthorized control over any of the elements in our architecture that I showed you, or exploiting vulnerabilities. We're going to call that compromise and exploit. Authentication and session management kind of, um, kind of defines itself there. But what about poisoning? In introducing deceptive or misleading data, for example, into a, a configuration system. What if an attacker could send poison data that then causes some type of access control decision to be done differently downstream because the data came in? Honestly, I got that idea from the uh, OWASP Top 10 for LLM, where they're talking about poisoning training data. I was like, oh, that's kind of a neat thing. Poisoning configuration data has the same type of effect. We talked about information disclosure and tampering. I brought those forward from Stride because I think they are still important. We have authorization as the second A there, and then lack of logging, and then L. Um, and S, segmentation, visibility, breakdown, and denial of service. OK, that's a bit of the potpourri category. Okay? I had some extra stuff at the end, and I'm like, I got to put these in here. But it, I started with S and then added these other things. But you know, segmentation is, is threats that would impact the difference between control plane and data plane, visibility, network visibility of the entire environment to secure it, and then denial of service fit in there. So how do we apply capitals then? How are we going to take this methodology and apply it to something that you're building? So a lot of this advice is the same advice, I would say, for threat modeling anything. You should be collaborative. You should have a diverse team of function coming together to help work on your threat model. All of these are, are principles that you'll find in that threat modeling manifesto that I mentioned earlier. You're going to consider each of the threat categories against the architecture. Remember, if you can dream it up, somebody else can exploit it. You're going to go through the brainstorming process, and then focusing on mitigations is the key. That's the key to all threat modeling. Spending 10 hours building the best diagram and the best list of threats and then not mitigating them is, has a very simple description for what you just did. It's called wasting time. Okay? Because if you're not mitigating, mitigations is where you get the change that comes out of this. And then there's always a prioritization exercise. So, all right, let's go into the reference architecture. I've got a number of threats that I have put together against this architecture. And those are the ones that I want to share with you. Some of them I borrowed from other sources because they were good. So the first one, an attacker subverts the zero trust decision process by compromising the policy enforcement point or the policy administrator. So these two crucial things that are, that are de determining, you know, policy enforcement point is in the stream here of when the requests are coming in. The administrator is communicating with that and updating policies. So a there is a threat, and this came from NIST 800-207. They have a couple of threats that people put into that NIST document. I thought this one was a good one. It was a good one to start with. So how do we mitigate it? Well, having proper timely patch management is going to be a crucial part of ensuring that the policy enforcement point and the administrator are up to date. Testing for any known security issues in that environment. And then limiting user access with just in time and just enough access. So show of hands, who has heard of this concept of just in time and just enough access? I must be living under a rock. Because <laughs> when I, I found it in Zero Trust, and I was like, oh, this is such a great thing. And apparently everybody else already knew about it forgot to tell me. OK. Um, hardening the uh, policy enforcement point for battle, too. Because like, if you think about it, this is the component that is going to take the brunt of the abuse in a zero trust environment, because that's really the front end of, of this system that we're running from. OK, what about zero days? Does, does zero trust, is it the ultimate solution for zero days? No, nobody has a solution for zero days. Still, this zero trust isn't going to save us from a zero day. Like, If you have a zero day, it, you could have a vulnerability in one of these policy enforcement points that is a zero day, gets dropped, and somebody gets into it. That's just the reality of it. But that's OK. There's no, nobody else has a good answer for zero days either, so we don't have to have one for zero trust specifically. OK, another threat and compromise and exploit. An attacker exploits an OWASP top 10 vulnerability in an administrative web interface. OK, I mean, I'm primarily an AppSec person, so I had to work in the OWASP top 10 relatively early in my list of threats. But think about all these different components that we have that are some control plane, some are data plane, that are going to potentially have administrative interfaces attached to them. And so that is a, a definitely a valid uh, challenge that we would have to be ready for. So first of all, our first mitigation, constrain all those interfaces to the control plane. 
So you might say, well, in a reference architecture, there would be no administrative interface here. Yes, but remember, we live in the real world. We don't live in, we don't live in a reference architecture. So you can't just assume that nobody put administrative interfaces there. Uh, so we want to keep that control plane isolated. We want system builders to understand the, the depth of the OWASP top 10, and we need to test that environment specifically. So now we go to authentication and session management. Threat number three, an attacker discovers or compromises the session management strategy and gains access to an object by impersonating another user or service. So kind of a standard threat for us in a web app world that plays out here in Zero Trust as well. So our mitigation's there. We've got to have TLS for all of those flows. We have to have a strong authentication token strategy with strong session identifier for users. Like session management is key here, having the right primitives that are creating these tokens and these identifiers, that's, that's really a really important piece of this. And then we need to protect the generation and distribution of service tokens. So what is a service token used for? We talked about this idea of a non-person entity, which is a fancy word for service or whatever. But if you're going to have tokens that are being used by non-person entities, the generation and distribution of those are crucial because if an attacker is able to get the token, the attacker can likely impersonate that NPE and use that to get some level of access they shouldn't have. Okay, the fourth one, an attacker steals or guesses a password using a brute force attack or some other type of thing, provides that password to a zero trust authentication that supports username password as a fallback authentication mechanism. And so you might think, well, it's zero trust, it's supposed to be MFA everywhere. Um, are you gonna bet $100,000 that the system that's deployed at your office doesn't have any fallback mechanisms for user ID and password? I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet a dollar that it doesn't have one. Because once again, this isn't a reference architecture in the real world. In the real world, we sometimes we have controls that allow for a fallback because for some reason somebody needed it to have a fallback perspective. So we can say we want impl to implement MFA, we want to disable the usage of those things. But once again, real world systems. So it's about managing the risk. If you do have to have one, how, what are the additional controls you're using to prevent that from ever becoming something that an attacker can take advantage of? Okay, so poisoning. An attacker poisons the continuous diagnostics and management data or injects false data to try to trick the authorization process into doing something that wasn't expected. That came from NIST 800-207. Once again, remember these CDM box here is representing agents and things that are running across your environment and collecting all the data about what's uh, versions and what's happening on various systems. And so if an attacker could somehow poison that data, they might be able to do, might be able to get an authorization decision to do something different. So whenever you see these diagrams like this, the CDM is always sitting off to the side, apparently unprotected. I don't think that's how it actually sits in the real world, but why not draw the CDM with a control plane and data plane separation? Why not use the same principle that we use here in Zero Trust of control plane, data plane, in the CDM as well? Have a control plane and then have a data plane that's actually touching the resources and receiving data from them. The second thing you can do there is cryptographically validate any CDM updates. So if someone tries to spoof an update and the updates have to be cryptographically signed and backed by your enterprise PKI ahead at the bottom, it's going to be tough to spoof a, a request and, and put you know something do, do something with that CDM data that, that is nefarious because if it's not signed and the system just drops those things on the floor, the attack vector has gone away. Okay, number six, attacker poisons or injects the threat intelligence feeds to prevent legitimate users from gaining access. So, a lot of times we get that threat intel from where? Somebody else. Sometimes you get it from your own sources, but often you, do, you receive threat intelligence from other outside vendors and it becomes part of your third-party risk approach. And so having a strong third-party risk program that is judging those types of vendors that you're receiving data from that are a part of the intricate part of your system here, it's important to, to be able to manage that risk by knowing what those third parties are doing for security and privacy and how they are uh, doing things to, to hopefully make your environment as their environment is strong as your environment. Then you can also apply threat modeling to your provider's architecture. You can stretch this and blow up this 
threat intel box to understand what the what the provider is actually doing and go through this same exercise against their environment to see are they opening you up to some risk that you uh, really don't want to accept. Okay, information disclosure. Attacker uses that CDM data as an intelligence feed if they can somehow snarf data out of it. So once again, we're back to if we had a control plane data plane separation, it'd be harder to try to, to snarf data out of it if all the data, all the access to data was in the control plane and, and highly protected. You got to patch that CDM systems, limit data exposed. That's just a good privacy principle, right? Limit the data to the minimum amount needed and don't store stuff you don't need. The same thing applies from this data in the CDM. Number eight, attacker accesses data access policies to understand the input to the policy engine. So you may have some of these policies up here at the top that are feeding into your policy engine and they're determining where, where, data, what, where the data is coming from that the policy engine is using to make decisions. And once again, zero trust this is a dynamic environment. This is not a static policy with three lines to, de to determine what people can do, right? This is a dynamic environment that's impacted by things like data access policies. And so really the, the mitigation there is just make sure the people that shouldn't have access to those policies aren't able to access them because the more the attacker knows about the environment, the, the more danger you're opening yourself up to. Okay, tampering. An attacker receives or tampers with data on the wire. Wait. Didn't we talk about zero trust is encrypted all the time and is always using TLS? I don't know about you, but I would never assume that an entire zero trust architecture was encrypted from end to end unless I was able to test it myself from end to end. Because once again, in the real world, sometimes there's a reason why, you know, we just couldn't encrypt the connection between these two things for some reason because of a legacy protocol or some compatibility thing. We needed an older version or whatever. And so that's why even though the zero trust purists will say that's not a real threat, it doesn't matter. You can't even list it. Yeah, I can because these are real things that happen in the real world. Sometimes people forget to apply all those best practices. Okay, how about an attacker can induce or coerce a non-person entity to do some task that the person or the attacker themselves is not privileged to perform? So when we think about NPEs or non-person entities, I want to introduce this idea of extreme least privilege. So with extreme least privilege, I want that NPE to be locked down in the policy enforcement point to the one action that, that, policy, that, that NPE is allowed to do. So if they're allowed to hit an API and perform a create option, operation, then I want that to be the limiting factor. I don't want them to have full access to, even to the whole endpoint. So when I'm talking about extreme least privilege, let's isolate these MPEs to the point where they're so locked down that they can only do the one thing that they're supposed to do or the handful of things they're supposed to do. Authorization, moving into that other A, attacker exploits a time of check versus time of use vulnerability in the policy engine. This is an old school attack, but it always rears its ugly head every couple of years and it just keeps coming back. And the, the idea of time of check versus time of use is if you have a policy review or check that's done as a request comes in and there is some extended period of time before the, the uh, uh, subject tries to use the access, Perhaps the dynamic policy changed in this case. Perhaps something changed in, in the policy that would now prevent that person. They had access at 8 o'clock, but at 10 o'clock they're not supposed to have access because some other extraneous or external thing happened to impact that policy. So the answer there is really just to, once again, that just in time and just enough access principle, applying that there. Like if they didn't use the access at 8 o'clock and they come back at 10 o'clock, they just have to go through the process again and be re every request needs to be reevaluated. Okay, 12 in the authorization stage, data incompatibilities. I introduced a new entity here that wasn't in the diagram earlier, the external policy attributes. Um, this is just the idea that there are there are some other conditions that may impact that policy engine. And so you could have one standard saying one thing and then you could have something else saying a different giving a different answer as to how things should be evaluated or order of operations and so i think that the answer on this one is really no first of all know what the attributes and sources are that are being munged together to form your policy and then you do really need to understand what's the order of operations that you want prescribed as the administrator of the system
you don't want the system to have to deduce through a number of sources what the correct thing that it should evaluate first is. Because if that's the case, it may choose the wrong thing, the thing you think is not as important. Okay, we're almost to the end of the threats here, but 13, lack of logging. So we have various components in the system that aren't logging. We're going to mitigate that by comprehensive logging from all of our elements and then logging, doing a logging audit to ensure we've got the right pieces being, being audited here. And then 14, an attacker accesses control plane resources from the data plane. Certainly is possible. It's something we have to think about. Is there, is there some interface that we may have opened that we weren't thinking about and didn't realize that made the control plane vulnerable or gave an, an avenue for an attacker to do something? So I'm going to advocate for threat modeling the control plane separately as the first step, and then aggressively testing those control plane interfaces, and then performing this, this idea of attack surface analysis and monitoring. There's a suite of tools. There's lots of startups that are doing that now, this attack surface management. I would point that at the control plane. I would define exactly what my interfaces are and, and what, things, what, what should be available. And then I would, I would use a tool to ensure if that changes by one item that I get alerted to it. And so I can go investigate, did somebody open an interface on my control plane that wasn't supposed to be opened? And then the 15 and final threat, attacker compromises the network layer devices and reconfigures the zero trust environment. So we forget when we look at these fancy architecture diagrams that there's actually routers and switches that are driving, that are connecting tish, connective tissue amongst all these other things. It's not as clean as these things just talk to each other directly. There is a network that's driving a lot of it behind the scenes. And so we want to threat model the network separately. We want to make sure we're patching and hardening those network devices, and we want to make sure the SOC uh, has full visibility into the network elements of these because there's lots of vendors that provide the PEPs and the PAs and the PEs that make up zero trust but we often forget the network layer and and thinking about how we can ensure we have the right visibility there so what are the lessons I learned in applying zero trust to threat modeling so first of all the universe of threats in a zero trust environment are enormous from identity all the way down to data subjects workloads there's lots of different areas of threats and so i shared 15 with you today the initial list i made as i was working on this and researching it i think i had 50 items on my list and so there's a lot of there's a lot of things to consider in in this zero trust environment so zero trust other things i learned requires a holistic view of the system so threats can exist anywhere in the architecture like i don't believe that only these threats can happen here no Anything's possible anywhere. It's easy to make assumptions about the strength of the zero trust system based on how people you know, kind of promote them to our industry. So don't necessarily believe that everything is as secure as, as people tell you. And zero trust is complex. That's one of the big takeaways that I had. This is a complicated, complex thing. It's not impossible because it's not all brand new stuff. It's a lot of things we've been doing for a long time, just packaged up slightly differently. But it is complicated and complex, which means from a threat modeling perspective, how do, we, how do we narrow down our scope? How do we make it simpler so that we can analyze and, and ultimately mitigate? And so from a key takeaways perspective, we talked about you know, threat modeling and secure by design default. These are things that help us move security and privacy forward with this zero trust environment. I talked about the process I like to use, scope, draw, analyze, mitigate, and retrospective. That's just the way that I like to teach it and the way it makes sense to me. Uh, there's never, you know, life, life is never as easy as the art of the reference or the reference architecture. And then hopefully folks can use this capitals methodology to, uh, to put it into action and use it to assess some zero trust environments and, and perform threat models. And then the last one's really threat model all the things, including the zero trust things. So I like to leave folks with that. <laughs> that is your call to action. Go threat model something. Next week, I mean, you can go to Halloween tonight after, but after tonight, go, well, you could threat model Halloween. That'd be a fun exercise that we could do in a different room, so. All right, so I'm, once again, um, this is who I am. That's some references to the podcasts. I do a uh, newsletter every week, too, called Reasonable Application Security um, that came from that use of reasonable in CIS's definition of, uh, of secure by design. In that, I uh, do five articles that caught my attention so if you want to sign up for that, it's fun. I promise I'll provide some snark and, and take on some of the things that people are doing. So I'd love to take any questions you might have. Um, 
Yeah, let's see, has anybody got any questions or anything? One, one right here in front, you can start us off. Yeah, for the methodology, do you have a, a reference, a link, or where you, there's more information on the methodology? Yeah, so question is, is there a link or a place where, they, where you can find the capital's methodology? Um, not, not today, probably by tomorrow or the next day there will be. Okay. I'm going to put it in a blog post where I share some of these thoughts, and then I'll share the capital's methodology and... Um, I may dump it in a GitHub repo as well, just in case anybody else wants to modify it or add to it or whatever, which would be, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, right here. You mentioned a little bit, I think, um, surface analysis. Okay. Where would you think that in, like, what state came from here? Any of the citations that are here? Um, yeah, so the question is attack surface analysis management. Uh, I don't really have any particular tools in that space. I tend not to recommend tools in large groups as well, just because other tool vendors then get mad. You didn't recommend me. Um, but I mean, the, I think the principle is sound in that, and you can use those tools for lots of other things to just see what new interfaces are being introduced into the environment. But in the zero trust world, it's that I'm really concerned with that control plane. Like when are new interfaces being introduced there? All right, right here. Um, so let's see. So yeah, okay. So really, the, the the question was: Is zero trust replacing classic network security? Is that a good good summary? Um, I mean, I think zero trust is really just a repurposing of a lot of things that we already had, yeah. because there are products that are being created to fill the need in particular spaces, like authorization and authentication. Policies at scale is nothing we haven't dealt with in web apps for 20 years at this point, right? And so I don't see zero trust as really, it, it's kind of the, people I think are applying it as the next generation of network security, of adding these additional things. Um, and I mean, I would argue like in, in the Google's got enough capacity to stop any DDoS coming in. But in there, if you look at their BeyondCorp reference architecture, they're letting their public IP addresses that are being used at people's desktops. So technically, I get their, environment would probably stop a DDoS before you could ever get it in the door because they've got a lot of capacity. But it's still, a, you know, still could be a potential if someone's in that type of a mode and doesn't have resources like Google does. That could be a thing, so. All right, last call. All right, well, thanks everybody for being, oh, I got one more, one more. Hold on, hold on, one more. This is my final question. Hmm. All the way, yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the point was made, zero trust is, is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something that's going to take a multiple years to phase in. And the advice being, hey, let's threat model all the way through. I think that's great advice, and I'm going to leave you with that. Threat model all the way through, zero trust. Thanks, everybody.